chapter number five verse number ten here's what the word of the Lord would say to us today y'all know I'm reading out of Amplified it says Elisha sent a messenger to him and this is Naaman saying go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean but Naaman was angry and went away and said behold I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord is God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leper. Are not Abana and Fapar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and said to him, My father, if the prophet had bid you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather than when he says to you, wash and be clean. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, as the man of God had said, and his flesh was restored like that of a little child, and he was clean. We're going to end the reading of the word of the Lord right there. Y'all know we've been in this series called Marching Orders all through uh, the month of March. And I, I want to conclude with this message today. Uh, I want to talk to us from the subject, the miracle is in the instructions. Do me a favor, spread that around the room and put that in the comment section. Say the miracle is in the instructions. Say, can y'all say that a little bit louder? I don't think y'all like, I know because we, we're talking about instructions and don't nobody want to do what nobody has to say. But the, the, the reality is the miracle is in the instruction. If you want to know what God has for you, if you want to see the truth of God made manifest in your life, heed what he told you. This is not even difficult. This is really, honestly, I could close my book and sit down because that's the whole message right there. Do what God told you to do. The miracle is in the instructions. You, you all know often I will begin the message with an interrogative. I, I'll ask a question, present a query, if you will, to see how we will respond to this, and, and today is no different. And I, I want to ask this question because I think it is a, a profoundly important question with regard to how we operate, what we do, and what our expectations are. What have we missed from God? because we failed to heed the instructions that were given. What did you not get? Because you didn't heed the instructions. That's a good question, isn't it? What, what part of God's intention passed over you because you just didn't do what he told you to do? All of us have moments <laughs> where we can acknowledge, if we're honest, that there were times when we just missed God. Okay, that's all right. Very tepid response over here. I was looking here, so I don't know what y'all did. I'm, I'm gonna say it again. Uh, all of us have moments where we miss God, where God told us to do something. He told us to engage with someone. He told us to give something. He told us to forgive. And we neglected to do it for a, a bevy of reasons, and we end up missing the benefit that God intended for us. There are some things that we missed, it wasn't God's fault. There are some things that didn't happen that profoundly were not God's fault. It was because we didn't do our part. God told us what to do, and we chose to do something else. How many times has God set us up to experience his glory made manifest? To experience his presence in a place. And we were too busy questioning whether or not the instructions that he gave us were for us, or whether or not they were too inconvenient. And we missed him. Because we were questioning the instructions. Do we not know that the Bible 
if we read this Bible for real, what you'll discover throughout the, from, from the top of the Bible to the end is full of instructions. Full. Adam and Eve, the, here, here are their instructions. God blessed them and said, instructions, be fruitful and multiply. Yeah? Take dominion over the earth. That's instructions. And that seems easy to follow until there's a part of the instructions that now becomes complicated. Everything in this garden is yours. You can touch everything. It's all yours. The only thing I need you to do is not touch that. That tree in the midst of the garden, don't touch that one tree. And sure enough, Eve went, inspected the tree, saw that the fruit was good to eat, took a little bite, and the Bible says, and Adam ate with her. So by no means am I casting aspersions on Eve because Adam knew better too. Period. Right? But the bottom line is, all they had to do was follow the instructions. We wouldn't be in the mess we're in right now if they had just followed the instructions. Yeah? It's, it's simple. And, and again, you read throughout the Bible, when you read through uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus and you look at the 626 laws and, and all of these things that God, it, the, those instructions weren't to limit the children of Israel. The, the instructions were designed to create a difference between, between the children of Israel and every other nation. God wanted them to be holy, and holy ultimately means different, not like anything else. Yes? And all they had to do was follow the instructions. One of the main ones, thou shalt have no other God before me. That's at the top of the list. That's God's number one instruction. And, and most of the trouble of Israel was attached to idolatry. That one, that, that, hear me, the Babylonian captivity, idolatry. Y'all call it. Most of their struggles, idolatry. Whenever they were deeply away from God, the root of it was idolatry. Because they couldn't heed that one instruction, thou shalt have no other gods before me. It wasn't even difficult. But because following the instructions has always been difficult, mostly because, and here, this, this, this is the crux of the whole matter, we think there is something better to do. It's not even hard. Some of y'all want, wanted a mystery. Well, well, when you look at the psyche of the human, and no, it's not even that. It is in general, most of us just feel like there's something better to do. Love your neighbor as yourself, but I don't like them. It's easier to, it's easier to, to hate them. That's something better to do. Yes? Okay, y'all gonna be like that today? All right, so let me, let me just, let me continue reading and so I can sit down because y'all are already... Old Testament laws, discipline, don't do, don't do, do this, don't do that. Watch this. And then look, if you read Deuteronomy 28, it's so easy. He says, if you obey my commandments, listen to the, listen to the results, you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come, blessed when you go. Blessed will be the fruit of your hands. Whatever you do will prosper. You, your storehouse will be blessed. You'll be the, the uh, above only, not beneath. The head and not the tail. The lender, not the borrower. All of that is attached to following the instructions. And that's the first part of Deuteronomy 28. And we often leave out the second half of Deuteronomy 28. But if you're disobedient, you'll be cursed in the field. Cursed when you come. Cursed when you go. Cursed will be your storehouse, right? Now, we understand, and I want to be clear, we understand that the curse has been removed. Yes, Galatians tells us all of that. But the idea was God was trying to set a precedent that if you'll just do what I tell you, there's a benefit to following the instructions. Yes? And the, the, part of the other issue is God often gives us instructions that just plain don't make good sense. Is there anybody else in, in the room who can testify that God has told you to do something that seemed a little bit crazy, a little bit out of touch with reality? Yeah? Look, so in, in John chapter number two, they run out of wine. Y'all know the story. They run out of wine at, at, the, at the wedding in Cana. And the Bible says that Mary, Jesus is there, and Mary, his mother, says to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Jesus says, I'm not even supposed to be doing nothing yet. I'm, I'm still chilling. And Mary says, if he tells you to do something, you do it. 
If you want, if you want a fix to your problem, do what he says do. And Jesus says, go get the water pots. And so, and most of us, if you're just reading the scripture, you, you kind of gloss over the fact that the water pots that they get are the pots that, that the guests use to wash their hands and their feet when they came into the house, right? So Jesus tells them to go get dirty water. So the servants know that the water that they are getting is not drinkable. You got feet dirt and hand dirt and, and all kinds of debris and detritus that is on the ground when you're walking in this water. And they go get the water pot and Jesus says, now dip a ladle in it and take it to the, the master of the house. And the servants are like, okay. They dip in, and they bring to this man dirty water. But because they're heeding the instruction, by the time the ladle gets to the master of the house, it has turned into wine. Now, here's the thing that we have to consider. Does it change into wine in the pot or does it change into wine in the ladle? Is it dirty water until they dip? It's the instruction that causes the shift. Because the miracle is actually in the instructions. Okay, y'all, that's, that's John too. Y'all don't like that. Uh, Luke 17 talks about these 10 lepers. We've heard this story before. The 10 lepers, they're in a leper colony. They have been separated from, from everybody else. They are forced to exist in a place where only sickness surrounds them. And they see Jesus at a distance and they yell to Jesus, Jesus, our son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus says, okay, go show yourself to the priest. Huh? We, we are clearly in a leper colony. The reason why we're yelling to you is because we can't get close to people. But the instructions are, break the rules and go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible says, so they just started walking. And on, as they moved towards the person, who would proclaim them clean, they became clean. That they were healed following the instructions. Yes? So sometimes God will give you crazy instructions. And sometimes God will tell you to do some insanely silly things. Like pray for them that despitefully use you. That's, that really is a hard one. I don't think we even understand how difficult it is to, to actually take time, say, Lord, bless them. And sometimes saying bless them, is the, is the, those are the hardest words to say, especially when they just put the knife in your back. And your job is to pray for them. They just dogged you to your boss. And God says, but pray for them. Y'all won't talk back to me. They just tried to ruin your relationship and God says, now pray for them. Huh? They just stole money from you. Oh, now it's over. There it is. And, and God says, now pray for them. And you're like, no. Why would I pray for somebody who just messed with Jesus said, pray for them that despitefully, despitefully use you. These, sometimes the instructions will drive you crazy. But this is, I, I'm speaking to you like Mary said to the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. It's going to challenge you. You may have to dip the ladle in dirty water. Do it. You may have to take the chance of being fired from your job because God gave you an, a crazy instruction. Because that's what the, the servants were jeopardizing their, their jobs by taking dirty water to the, to the master of the house. But by the time they got there, he said, not only is, this, is, is wine still left, but this is the best of all of the supply. Sometimes you got to take a chance on a crazy instruction. Do me a favor, just, just tell somebody around and put that in the comments section. Say, sometimes you got to take a chance on some crazy instructions. Let, let, let me go a little bit further. Can I, can I help y'all? 
when, 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 when the preacher says, lean over and tell your neighbor, I know that's when most of us, you know, you, know, you got you to find something in your pocket and, and, and oh, let, me, let me pull out my purse and see if I can find that one piece of chewing gum I've been looking for for three weeks. Those are also instructions. And sometimes we don't see the intrinsic benefit of it. I'm tired of talking to my neighbor. You got on the mask, you can't smell their breath, I hope. But sometimes it's the simple things that create the breakthrough that we've been looking for, but we often try to find a reason to not follow the instructions. Can I say this to you? Some, some of you all are looking for a major deliverance. It is about to happen, but here's what you need to know. It's going to be attached to instruction. God, I need you. I need, my, my health is messed up. And the Lord says, okay, I'll heal you, but first, change your diet. Um, no, Lord, I need you to heal me. I will. But I also need you to stop doing damage to your body. <laughs> but it tastes good, but it's bad for you. Or how about moderation? Okay, y'all, y'all are... I thought you was preaching the Bible. I thought I was too, but okay. Follow the instructions. God, I, I need you to heal my marriage. Okay, I need you to forgive. You don't know what he did to me. Sure he does. But the marriage can't be restored. Yeah, he messed up. And I'm, I know I'm making this one side, but yeah, he messed up. You, you have been perfect the whole marriage. He messed up. And now he's trying to fix it, but you won't forgive. But then you pray to God and say, my marriage is a mess. Yeah. And at this point, it's not his mess up that's messing up the marriage. It's your recalcitrant heart that won't let it go that's keeping the marriage messed up. Okay, y'all don't want to talk back to me. That, so the, the issue isn't the infraction. The issue is you won't let it go. You won't forgive. And forgiveness is a part of the mandate of a believer. Oh, my God. How, how about this? If we want to be forgiven, Jesus says you must forgive. Loving your neighbor as you love yourself means you got to forgive. There's some things you got to release. If you want it fixed, you got to follow the instructions. There are patterns that God lays out for us to ensure that we get what we're asking for. It's in the instructions. God, I need more money. Thou shalt remember, Deuteronomy 8.18, thou shalt remember that it is the Lord thy God that gives you power to get wealth to establish his covenant. God, I need more money. Can you keep my covenant? God, I need more money. Will you take credit for your increase? Or will you give it to me? Because if we're unwilling to heed the instructions, God is not obligated to put us in a position where he makes us sin. Man, I, I could run around a whole church on that. God is not going to induce us to sin. Ooh, this is better preaching than y'all responding, I promise. This is Bible. The Bible tells us that God will never author sin in us. Period. So yes, God will measure our ability to be obedient before he releases things to us. Because what he won't do is be the reason why we fell. So we have to learn how to heed the instructions. Oh, y'all good and tight and hidden. All right, this is fine. Let, let, let me see if I can get to the text. So we have to recognize that the deliverance you've been praying for, the breakthrough, hear me, and, and I want to be very clear. Naaman was dealing with his issue. He was managing with something he wanted to be delivered from. It is possible to function 
broken. Good Lord Almighty. It is possible to do well in one thing and struggle in another area. Naaman is known as a champion of Syria, but he's a leper. And what he's trying to do is escape the, but he's a leper, and it is totally out of his control. Has, has anybody ever needed God to do something that you just don't have the ability to do on your own? I don't care how much you pray, I don't care how much you fast, I don't care how many self-help books you read, you don't possess the ability to fix it. There are some things that only God is a solution for. And some of us, and, and, and oh, I, I feel the Holy Ghost right here, some of us have been hiding our issues in our success. Trying to, we, we don't want people to know how fragile we are. So we front with our success. We hide behind the success and never deal with the fracture behind the success. And we're willing to live broken in, in private, successful in public, and we never ask God to fix it because we don't want to follow the instructions. And here's what's crazy. God allows Naaman to capture a servant who is serving his wife and the young lady is an Israelite. And of course, in Israel, by now, the, the, the talk of miracles, signs, wonders, the presence of the Lord, the effects of the presence of the Lord have, 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 have been uh, permeated throughout all, throughout all of Israel that even a young girl can testify of the goodness of the Lord. And she says, uh, it's, it's too bad Naaman won't go and see the prophet in Israel because he could heal Naaman. The thing Naaman is, is privately struggling with, there is a public deliverer and all he has to do is just talk to the deliverer and his situation will be fixed. So Naaman is like, word? You mean to tell me that I don't have to live a duplicitous life? You mean to tell me that I can actually be free? And sometimes your freedom is in your, is in your decision to move away from the thing that you've been managing. If you want to be free, you got to decide to move. I'm going to say that again. If you want to be free, you have to decide to move away from the thing that you've been nursing. God, I'm trying to get away from that, but I'm, I'm, I, somebody needs to hear this today, that somebody has been nursing an issue. You're not trying to get delivered from it, you're nursing it, because you don't know how to fix it. So you're just doing everything you can. And what Naaman would do to nurse his issue is he would cover it. He would cover it and then he would put his armor on. Good God Almighty. Y y y did y'all hear what I just said? The Bible says that Naaman had an issue. He would wrap something around the leprous part of him and then he would put his armor on. And as long as people saw the armor, they didn't see the leprosy. And the servant says, you don't have to live like that. Go and see the prophet who has your answer. So Naaman goes to his king and says, hey, I need you to send a letter to the king of Israel because I just heard that my deliverance is in Israel. So the Syrian king writes the letter. They send gifts, money, all of these things. And when the letter comes to the king of Israel, the king of Israel says, oh, he's trying to pick a fight. The king, because the king of Israel does not have the context of Naaman's life. He just has a letter that he's written. He said, this looks like they want to fight. So the Bible says that the king rent his clothes and he's saying, am I God? I'm not the one who can heal. I'm not the one who can deliver. I can't give life. Why is he asking me to do this? He never consults the prophet. He just goes in the morning trying to avoid a war. And the Bible says that Elisha hears about it and he says to the king, he says, why are you troubling yourself like this? You're tripping. Send Naaman to me. I'll take care of it. So the Bible says Naaman, and I need y'all to understand, I, I want to paint this picture. Naaman is the champion of Syria. Everywhere he goes, he is celebrated. Everywhere he goes, everybody says, oh, that's the champion. Look at the champion. Here come the champ. It's like if Mike Tyson were to walk in the room, we would still call him champ. Right? Even though he bit off an ear, he got that issue. Uh -huh. He's still a champ. Right? 
So imagine, you, you know, let, let's just call naming Mike Tyson for, for a minute. Mike Tyson walks in the room. Everybody's like, oh, the champ is here, the champ is here, the champ is here. So there, after a little while, you start believing your press. Because one of the things that the text doesn't say, it, it, it doesn't say explicitly, but it does say implicitly, is that Naaman likes being Naaman. So, so you got this pride thing, but you got a need that's hidden. But you got this pride thing. And the pride thing won't let you ask for help until you discover the only way I can get free from this thing is I got to reduce myself. I got to get out of pride in order to ask for help. But now I've been sent to the prophet, so he goes to the prophet in full Naaman. He gets to, to Elisha's house, and Elisha doesn't come out. He sends a servant, and the servant says, uh, the prophet told me to tell you, uh, go and dip in Jordan seven times and you'll be clean. And Naaman is like, but I'm Naaman. You mean to tell me that I came all this way as Naaman? I came all this way with gifts and I came all this way with money because I'm trying to buy what I can't really afford. And I'm Naaman. And he's going to send a servant talking about go dip in some dirty water? Are you kidding me? And the Bible says that Naaman is in a rage. Why are you in a rage? Number one, you didn't have the common courtesy to come out of your house. You didn't deign to get off of your couch and come and talk to me. You sent a message through a servant. I don't talk to servants. I'm Naaman. Oh, y'all here in the Bible, y'all not here in real life. Well, if it ain't the pastor. Uh-oh. But what did Bishop say? No, 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 no. We got all these elders in the church, all these ministers, all these people who are up and coming preachers and, and, and people who hear from the Lord. There are other prophets in this house. Did it go out? Is it on? Well, if Bishop didn't say it, then I'm not. We don't recognize how much like Naaman we actually are. That if it doesn't come from the top, if I didn't hear it myself from the bishop, if I didn't hear it myself from my favorite preacher, I don't have to accept that. And sometimes God is checking to see if we're operating in pride by sending a real word through a lesser vessel to see how we'll respond if it ain't the head honcho. All of your messages ain't gonna come from the CEO. I promise you, I, listen, I worked in the secular arena for 20 years. I know, what, trust me, I don't need my boss to come and tell me you're getting a raise. Send me an email. Send me an email and, and, and oh, your, your performance review was exceptional. So blah, 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 blah. I thank you. And my response is thank you. I don't care who tells me. But when it comes to spiritual things, we needed to be deep. We needed to be mysterious. We need background music. We need our strings in the background. Play some strings. The saith the Lord. That's what we want. And it is absurd and ridiculous because we're too proud to hear a simple message. And Naaman is mad. Name it is, I mean, he is in a rage and he's like, I can't believe he wouldn't even come out here and talk to me. And the servants are like, uh, sir, if he told you to do something grand, you wouldn't have mind how he gave you the message. You want credit for a deliverance you can't even do for yourself. 
How, how many of us really only do what we do because secretly we're harboring, oh, they're going to thank me for this. I, I get to have a little bit of credit. They're going to recognize me just a little bit. What happens when God pulls you completely out of the equation? You can't take no credit for being clean in dirty water. See, no, 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 listen, listen to this. I need you to understand. Would you, would you, would you, would you, would you, would you get in somebody else's dirty bath water to be clean? Would you, would you? You don't know them, they're strangers and losses, but your deliverance is in that water. And your response is, but Lord, I have a shower at home. I have marble tile. I have three nozzles that, that hit me from three different directions and I just stand there and get clean. But the Lord says, no, no, no. Your deliverance is not there. Your deliverance is in dirty bath water. Are you willing to submerge yourself in filth for freedom? And they're saying to him, the servant says, Master, if he had told you to do something grand, you would have done it. If he told you to climb a mountain, you would have done it because your cameras would have caught it. You would have had something to post on the internet on my way to deliverance. Oh, don't play like that's not what we do. Hashtag generosity. Because we like having credit. But what happens when the instructions are simple but degrading to our pride? Not in real life, but degrading to our pride. And, and, and they're like, sir, if it was grand, you would have done it. You wouldn't have no problem. If it was big, you would have done it. You wouldn't have had a problem. And you tripping because he told you to go and dip seven times in dirty water. We know that there are cleaner rivers. We know that. But here's what we also know. We also know that when you get a God divinely uh, uh, ordained instruction, you should probably do it. And let me say this to you. Everybody needs somebody in their life who will tell you, just go do it. Stop tripping. You in your head, go do it. Oh, oh, oh no, no, you're being a little bit proud right now. You just need to do what God tells you to do. Everybody needs a friend whose, whose job is to tell you, stop being dumb. Go do what he said do. See, here's the thing. We, are, we surround ourselves with yes people. But sometimes the greatest damage that we do to ourselves is having friends who only agree with us. But name and service are like, sir, you want to be delivered and we want you to be delivered. We want you out of this. We don't want you suffering like this. And all you got to do is follow the instructions. You want a miracle, but you won't follow the instructions. You want breakthrough, but you won't do what God is telling you to do. You want change, but you won't do what the Lord instructed you to do. Just go do it. It's not hard. It's easy. God wants to heal you. Are you willing to participate? Mm -mm -mm. Let me say that again. Are you willing to participate in the deliverance you've been praying for? Or is God going to do everything? Have we become so lazy? Have we become so mired in old school process that we're not willing to actually participate in the deliverance we've been praying for? Hear me. The water does not turn into wine without an obedient servant. The lepers remain lepers until they start moving. The man... At, at, at the pool for 38 years, he doesn't get healed until he obeys. Pick up your bed and walk. 
haven't been able to walk, just take up your bed and walk. I, I, I don't have no help. Just take up your bed and walk. But, but I, I've been looked over. I've been sitting here 38 years and nobody helped me get in water. Dude, just take up your bed and walk. But I can't. Just try. It's simple. Dunk your head in that dirty bath water. And we, and we struggle. So some of y'all right now, y'all are like, but I'm supposed to do that? Yes. It's not hard. Ooh, y'all won't talk back to me today. Y'all are tight. Okay, Naaman. So, <laughs> we, we have to be, we have to understand that God's intention is for deliverance. God's intention is for breakthrough. God's intention is for freedom. God's intention is that we not be bound by anything. That's God's intention. But our responsibility has to meet God's intention. And sometimes God's intention is, has to be met with, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And that's where the struggle is. That, that's where saints get jacked up. Because whatever you tell me to do is often something I really don't want to do. I don't want to dip seven times in no dirty water. But that's all you had to do. You didn't have to do anything but go to the Jordan and dip in it seven times. That's actually very simple instruction if you think about it. You know what I'm saying? Go to McDonald's and pay for the seven people behind you. See, and somebody says, seven? But what if number seven is the activator for, your million, for, for you to be a millionaire? Is, is, that, is that $100 worth it? I mean, it's only McDonald's. <laughs> he didn't say five guys, he said McDonald's. And we struggle. Because the instructions don't make sense. Why, why would I do that? Why not? That's what the servants are saying. Why, why wouldn't you do it? And sure enough, the Bible says he goes to the Jordan. After all of his histrionics, he still goes to the Jordan. He dips seven times and he comes up with all of his skin reset. Not just the spot that had the leprosy, God reset all of him. Okay, yeah, yeah. See, here is what you're missing. God, the miracle is not just about fixing that little thing. The miracle is, hear me, God does not just want you healed, he wants you whole. And he doesn't tell Naaman, I'm going to fix your whole life. He just says, follow the instructions. You want your whole marriage fixed, not just that one issue y'all been dealing with. You want your whole mind regulated, not just that one issue. You want your whole business to flourish, not just deal with that one thing that's causing a deficit. And the thing is what God is saying is, I won't just touch the little piece. I will touch all of you. Naaman didn't realize that he was getting a fresh start. We all struggle with something on our skin. What would you do if God said, I'm gonna give you skin like a baby? What if all your crow's feet and, and, and all your lines, and, and y'all won't talk back to me, all the imperfections are gone. Y'all, I promise you, your Instagram will, will be full of fresh face. Don't play me, don't play me. No makeup bay. But these are the things that we have to consider. God wants to hear me. Because what this is the, the word the Lord has been saying to me over and over again for, for several months now is a word revival. And what God wants to do, what God's desire is, is to unleash revival 
on his people. Y'all want to know what revival is? Revival is not just coming back to life. Because that's what we reduced it to. And, and, you know, in a church circle, revival is multiple days of services. Are we going to revival? But really, it's just a whole bunch of church. And this is not to say that that won't happen here. I'm just simply saying that our traditional understanding of revival has, has been, uh, unfortunately, uh, become an idiomatic thing in church. So when you talk about revival, it's not about a refreshing. It's not about God doing something unusual. It is the repetition of what we know to be normal. But y- y'all want to know what the biblical definition of revival is? In, in uh, Luke 15, when, when the prodigal son comes home, the father says, my son is alive again. He is revived. But you know what that term means? It means uh, uh, reset to God's intention. That's what revival is. Re- real revival is coming back to what God originally intended for you. If we want revival, I don't just want to. That's good. I, listen, I love dancing. I love shouting. I love praising. And, and, and revival is not just being slain on the altar either. Because there are some people who will lay out on the altar and next week back in the same thing they were laying out on the altar for. But what happens when God says, follow the instruction and I'll reset your whole life to what I always intended. Follow the instruction and I'll make you what you could never make yourself. Follow the instruction and I'll show you how to do the business. Follow the instruction and I'll show you how to manage the increase. All I need you to do is do what I say. You want a miracle, I'll give you an instruction. You want a deliverance, I'll give you an instruction. You want change, I'll give you an instruction. You think Joshua won, W-O-N, just because he was skilled as a fighter? No. Joshua won because of Joshua won, O-N-E. Which is, this book of the law, instruction, shall not depart from your mouth day and night. You will meditate on it day and night. Your success is in the instruction. If you meditate on the instruction, watch this, not only will you have repeatable success, but you decide how much you win. Y'all, that's what what Joshua 1 and 8 says. That if you follow the instructions, you determine your own victory and you can teach other people to do it. Yeah. Repeatable success. Your miracle is in the instruction. What God is looking for is not readers of the word. He's looking for doers of the word. Because most of us can quote scripture. If I say Psalm 23 and in as one, The is my shepherd, I, is memorized. Here's a very, very important question. How many of y'all want it today, though? How many of you had a want? So if the Lord is my shepherd, and because he's my shepherd, I shall not want, how did I have a need? The answer is, there is some instruction you didn't follow. The shepherd led and you didn't follow. But we're talking about naming, so let me me just. What God has for us, please play something because I need to remember I'm done. What God, no, because I promise you I can keep going. Because the issue, because I don't want y'all to feel like I'm fussing at you, but, but the issue is there, are, there is so many things, there are so many things in good English, there are so many things that we have left on the table. So many things that we did not accomplish. Healings, breakthroughs, deliverance, change, family change, all because there was that one instruction we just weren't comfortable with. I, Lord, I just don't know about that. And what the Lord is trying to show us in this moment, hear me, there are miracles on tap for you. 
good God Almighty, I felt that in my spirit. I'm going to say that again because I don't know if y'all really heard what I said. There are miracles on tap for you. There is breakthrough on tap for you. Signs and wonders assigned to your life. I need you to hear me online. There are miracles, signs, and wonders assigned to your life. And God is saying, if they would just do the one thing I told them to do three years ago, you could have had a miracle three years ago. You've been suffering in disobedience. It's not that God didn't hear you. He heard every single word you prayed. What he's been waiting for is your compliance. And today my job is to be the servant of Naaman. If it was something grand, you would have done it. If it was something publicized, you would have done it. Just go dip. Go follow the instructions. The miracle you've been looking for is in the, is, is in the one thing you've been reticent to do. Follow the instructions. Say yes. I want my life to change. Say yes. I need things to be better. Say yes. I need to overcome this. Say yes. It's not hard. There's a reason why I started this message singing, I'll say yes, Lord, yes. Because I wanted to, I wanted to frame it in your minds that ultimately compliance is key. Put that in the comment section. I may not say this, say, tell you to put anything else in the comment section, but say compliance. Somebody say compliance is key. It's not just your way. It's not just what you want to do. But God is saying, what did I tell you to do? What are the instructions? You want to be saved. You want to, you, you, you want to have a deeper relationship with God. It's follow the instructions. And the instructions here are just Believe. Confess, receive, accept. Yes? If you would confess the Lord Jesus, believing that God raised Christ from the dead on the third day, you shall be saved. Salvation is that simple. And the responsibility is on us because the gift has been given. Our job is to receive it. And it starts with the confession of our faith. Yes? So do me a favor, repeat after me, whether you're online or in person. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I believe your word that you died and you rose just for me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. And I'll serve you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. And listen, just like that. It is so simple. Salvation begins at that point where we make a faith-filled confession. That's where it begins. Jesus said in John chapter number 3, except a man or a woman is born of water and spirit, they cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, the, the, the confession begins the journey, but we all still need to be baptized in the water. We all still need to be baptized in the Spirit. 